Are we ready? Hello, so I am Jessica Jerzak. Uh, I'm Nathan Ryan. I'm Kristen Kimbrell. And I'm Kirsten Prendel, and we'll be talking about how waterfowl influence the water quality uh, at Marion Lake. So when conducting our research, we decide that when looking at how uh, the geese potentially affect the water quality on the lake, and to also see what we can do to accommodate this. And to cover what uh, this question, we'll be talking about the cyanobacteria, the effects of the water column, the role of the that the geese play, uh, the experiments that we uh, completed for this project, uh, potential solutions that we found, and any conclusions that we drew. Okay, so yeah, um, to start off, we thought that addressing the problem of the cyanobacteria um, would really be beneficial. So um, as you can see in this graph, um, during the warmer months of summer, the sedimentation, um, the retention rate becomes a lot more negative. And so because of this, it starts to create a really conducive environment um, for the cyanobacteria to grow and develop. And so um, this environment um, will include the warmer temp temperatures um, you know, that come across during the summer months. And as the negative sediment retention um, becomes more negative, it starts to release a lot more phosphorus into the water system. And um, then, in addition, uh, hypolimnetic anoxia, it is a process, um, it's a deep water depletion of dissolved oxygen. And then also, the diatoms that are in the sediment, um, they release chlorophyll A. And so all of these factors, they come together to play a huge role um, in being a conducive environment for the cyanobacteria to grow. And so the sediment itself um, will act as a nutrient source and a sink. Um, and so as it continues to recirculate and get stirred up, um, the phosphorus will actually just continue to recirculate as well um, and really just cause that to grow a lot more. And so ultimately the effects of this are the production of the harmful algal blooms that we're seeing at Marion County Lake. Um, and you can see in this graph as well that during the warmer months of May, June, July, um, during the summer is actually whenever the toxic strains of the cyanobacteria are favored. Um, you can see that with this huge spike um, and the non-toxic strains are actually almost zero. Um, and so because of this, then the cyanotoxins are produced and it's, you know, a variation of different neurotoxins and everything um, that have very detrimental effects on the health of the organisms that interact with this water and they can even be fatal effects. Okay, so looking at the effects of the water column, uh, a lot of mixing happens at Marion Lake both from wind mixing because this is Kansas and we're very windy. And then also geese mixing that occurs during the winter because the when, uh, migrating geese populations are so extreme that they can actually keep the lake from freezing. So obviously when there's a lot of you know, geese paddling around, they also stir up the water a lot. And the effects that that mixing can have on the growth of cyanobacteria are, are some of them at least are as follows. Uh, when the water mixes, of course, it gets more cloudy, and so the sunlight can only go so far as compared to when it's all still and, uh, and clear and all of that. And then that also affects the stability of the water column. Uh, cyanobacteria are very buoyant, and so if the uh, water gets mixed enough for a prolonged period of time, they can't, the cyanobacteria can't maintain their position in the water column, and so they, they sink deeper and they don't have that access to sunlight that they need, and so they, of course, die off, which is a good thing. Um, and then also the mixing affects the nutrient distribution throughout the water column as well. And so the effects of sediment specifically uh, as Kristen said, the sediment can act as a source or a sink for phosphorus and other nutrients. <laughs> and then, uh, oh goodness, sorry, lost my train of thought there. Uh, and then, it can, uh, as it, since it is a source or a sink, it can also affect the uh, loading of nutrients into the water after external loading has been reduced. So. 10 years down the road, the water, uh, 
the, <laughs> the water quality can still have a lot of phosphorus in it, despite the fact that any uh, external loading has been eliminated. Uh, additionally, through research, uh, it was found that microbial organisms on the uh, sediment interface can lower the amount of phosphorus that is released into the water column. Okay, so the main focus of our uh, project was the role of the geese in the phosphorus concentrations of the lake. And it's been found at other lakes uh, throughout the world that geese and other waterfowl are important, uh, very significant uh, nutrient vectors to freshwater systems. Uh, at this reservoir in Pennsylvania, uh, the geese during the winter months were by far the largest importers of phosphorus to the system. And I just put this one graph up here, but this is not unusual, especially with small uh, man-made lakes. This is pretty common, actually. Um, so the habits of the geese, the reason they import so much phosphorus is they forage in fertilized agricultural areas or golf courses and ornamental areas. They're also highly fertilized and then import that phosphorus via their fecal matter to the lake. So from this graph you can see that the goose that we're dealing with, the Canada goose, is by and far an outlier when it comes to fecal size and fecal rate, um, meaning that they poop a lot and they poop many times per day. So with an average of almost 25 fecal um, excrements per day, uh, you get, and 3.5 grams per excrement, you get 85 grams of feces per bird per day. And according to other research, about half of this will end up in the watershed and half will end up in the areas where they forage. Um, but w those areas might also, that phosphorus might end up in the watershed also through erosion and other things. So, uh, so the, later we're going to look at the carrying capacity from, uh, that you can see down there. Okay, so for our project, we did two main experiments, a water quality experiment and then also a fecal leaching experiment. Uh, I'll be talking about the water quality one. We took samples of water from four different locations around the perimeter of Marion Lake and then brought them back to K-State and ran phosphorus and nitrogen concentration tests on them. The steps that we used are seen in the, the slide. Uh, however, our results were inconclusive, and we believe that is due to the time that we took the samples being right before the, the migrating geese came back. And also, it's later in the season, it got, had gotten colder, and the lake had kind of settled a little bit, so there wasn't as much sediment uh, mixed around, and so the, also the nutrients had also settled a bit. Okay, um, so yeah, we had collected a few feces samples as well. Um, and so we wanted to test the leaching properties of them um, to see how they would actually affect the lake. And so after we collected them, we dried a 40 gram sample of the feces um, for two days in an oven. And then we ground it down to a fine powder. And at that point, we separated it out and we put 10 grams of the dried sample um, added to 100 milliliters of water, um, which was a water sample uh, very similar to the lake to have the active microbes in it. Um, and we did that four different times to have four different trials. And so for two of them, we covered them and set them aside. And the other two, we filtered them right away to find the immediate leaching um, results of it. And then we kept the solution that was filtered out after for testing. And then the two covered samples that we had done, um, we let them sit uh, for a whole week to see how they would leach over time. And so then after a week, we um, filtered that out the same way and we kept the solution that was filtered out as well. And we sent all four samples as well as a control of just the water um, that we had added the feces to, um, to be tested in the labs to see how the nutrients leached out and what all happened. Okay, so what we found was that the phosphorus concentration increased markedly um, with, or it correlated markedly with the time that it spent in the water. So the immediate leach had, as you can see, less than half the amount of phosphorus concentration that the one week leaching had. 
Um, and we are primarily concerned with phosphorus, but we looked at nitrogen also, and you can see that the, the one week uh, leaching had less nitrogen than the immediate, and we think that this is due to the biofilms that uh, accumulated on the top of the beakers that didn't make it through the filter. Those probably had a lot of proteins and biomass that had absorbed all the nitrogen. And then the gray bar at the bottom is just the concentration of the water we used from Campus Creek. So uh, I don't have the citation up there, which I apologize, but there was a research group in Japan that did the carrying capacity, or they attempted to find a carrying capacity of waterfowl for some eutrophic lakes uh, over there. And so they came up with this formula that's just multiplication. And I made some assumptions to make it work for Marion County Lake. So I used the Kansas Department of Health and Environment's uh, TMDL for the lake. And then I also assumed that half of the feces that the geese produce will end up in the lake. And that the nutrient content uh, of the feces matched our experimental findings. And so what it comes out to is the carrying capacity for Marion County Lake is about 1,000 geese. And that would be if there were 1,000 geese there every day of the year. But that's not really the reality. It's probably a few hundred geese every day. And in the winter, maybe like upwards of 10,000 geese. We don't know. Um, but basically, what you can extrapolate from that is that for every 1,000 geese, you get about a kilogram of phosphorus per day. So in the winter, when there's 6,000 geese out there, that's six kilograms of phosphorus every single day. So when investigating potential treatment options to implement on the lake, we decided it was best to look at natural solutions for the removal of the nutrient concentrations at the lake without uh, disrupting any uh, lakeside recreation. And so three options that we considered were floating waterbeds, a constructed wetland, and any type of lakeside vegetation such as riparian buffers, natural grass, etc. And so we determined that the most feasible solution would be the floating waterbed treatment. And so those are, a floating waterbed is essentially a foam mat that floats on the water surface that contains holes for cups to hold vegetation that directly uptakes the nutrients from the water. So their roots are um, inundated in the lake water. And so we find this to be a good solution because it has, they are known to have high nutrient removal rates, both of nitrogen and phosphorus. They can be easily assembled and deassembled and are cost effective, as well as they utilize uh, natural vegetation to the areas that they're implemented in. And they, because they do take up surface uh, area on the water, they can decrease any uh, area for waterfowl to loiter around on the lake surface. So in terms of the potential implementation on the lake, based on literature, we estimate that about an acre or so of a uh, floating waterbed would be needed to be implemented on the lake, which seems like a lot, but to put into perspective, the lake is 300 acres of water surface area, so, and that can be divided into the various coves as shown in this image. And so they can be divided into various sections and are meant to be implemented in areas that are five feet deep or less. And so that can be put and tethered away from any swimming areas, boating areas, fishing areas as well. And the only real, maintenance required for floating waterbeds is the harvesting of the biomass after a period of time, as well as cleaning off any waterbed debris that can accumulate. Okay, so throughout our um, experiment, we tried to tackle it from every angle that we could think of. Um, and through our research and the calculations and the solutions that we have suggested, um, we really do think that the issue can be reversed um, and that they can have a good recovery. Um, it'll take a lot of dedication and it'll take some time because it's not an immediate change. Um, but we think that the, the things that we have found and the solutions that um, we've come up with will really help benefit Marion County Lake a lot. Does anybody else have anything to add? So there's references. Are there any questions? How did you select the most feasible solution? 
So out of those three options, we felt the floating waterbed would be best in terms of space, as Marion County Lake has a lot of residential area. A constructed wetland would also perform similar in terms of the nutrient removal. However, that requires a bit of space. And so there wouldn't necessarily be an appropriate location for that, as well as it would require pumping the water from the lake up to the constructed wetland and then allowing it to flow back in. And then the vegetation, while it helps with the runoff coming into the lake, it wouldn't necessarily help uh, with the removal of nutrients currently already in the lake water, especially with geese as well coming with the migratory season, it would just kind of continue to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Yes? What's a water column? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, well, it's just the distribution of uh, water properties across, uh, vertically. Uh, there's the thermocline, which is like the separation between the cooler temperatures at the deeper end of things and then the uh, warmer surface temperatures. So it's, yeah, that's, and then of course the sediment at the bottom. So it's just looking at the changes that occur across from the, the deepest point to the surface. I don't think there's an inventory that's been done, but when we were out at the lake, they did mention that the lake doesn't freeze in the winter because there are so many geese. So, you know, that's definitely more than a thousand, so it's definitely more than they should be contributing. And if you also add in the fact that it's already receiving four times, the lake's already receiving four times the amount of phosphorus that it should from other sources, then there definitely isn't any space for, you know, thousands and thousands of geese. And I guess in terms of the spatial distribution that you mentioned, we did learn from the people at the lake that they do tend to accumulate in two specific spots on the lake. However, with mixing and how they move around and everything, it doesn't necessarily have like a humongous con uh, contribution to the water quality necessarily, but more so just those areas, I guess. I don't know. Any other questions? <laughs> so with your, what was the, uh, the floating waterbed treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, roughly how much does that cost per year to install and say a So based on my the literature I've looked at, really again that example was of a commercial uh, floating wetland. Uh, waterbed treatment and so there are commercial options that can be a little bit more pricey but you can literally hand make them using like EVA like the garage floor mats and just cut holes for the cups to hold the plants and so based on what I have found you know could just be a couple hundred dollars for the amount really in total maybe a little bit more or less and of course with how those are assembled as they are like mats that just connect um, you can always start with a smaller amount and then work your way up over time to help with the cost and also just the implementation itself. That was just a general estimate that I had uh, come up with based on our literature compared to the size of the overall lake. And are they pretty uh, durable? They can be, yeah. EV so it's specifically EVA foam that those mats are, and those, again, they can be used as garage floor mats. They're very durable. They do obviously weather over time, however, they can be easily replaced. <laughs> and that example specifically had it tethered down using some rope and a PVC pipe, as well as having um, some fencing to help keep waterfowl from interfering too much. Mm -hmm. 